Hello, it's Sean Atwood of National Geographic Channels Locked Up Abroad. This is part two of my video series on sexual health in prison. And the next question is... Neighbouring countries such as Canada and Mexico have had condom distribution and needle exchange programmes in effect as early as 1993. Would you say that there are cultural differences with regards to how Americans treat and perceive their prisoners? Yes, the Canadians are much more level-headed than the Americans when it comes to treating their prisoners. In America, it's mostly lock them up and throw away the key. So, if you look at the Canadian or even the Scandinavian system versus the American system, American system is an absolute disaster. Most people come in there arrested for soft drugs, weed is the biggest one. They graduate to shooting up heroin and crystal meth, catch deadly diseases, join these gangs, and they just get out and commit more crimes. That's why it all ends up an absolute disaster for the taxpayers who have to pay you know, tens of thousands of years to house all these guys and pay for all the medical f uh, fees as well. Do you think that these programs could ever be implemented on a federal level? Well, if the federal government started to implement programs that the public perceived was helping prisoners, they would lose votes. So that's why all these politicians take a hard stance against prisoners. You know, giving them condoms, giving them clean needles, what next? You're going to give them medals. That's the kind of attitude from people. So I don't see that happening anytime soon. Needle exchange programs, though currently losing state and federal funding, are generally well perceived both in the public and private sector. What do you think are some of the reasons why political headway is being met more, more so with regards to the treatment of intravenous drug users and not with regards to the safety and treatment of sexually active male prisoners? Well, needle exchange programs are well received in certain states because they save the taxpayer a lot of money. If people are spreading these diseases around and then the bills goes over to the taxpayers because they have a duty to give the tr uh, prisoners medical treatment, it adds up to an absolute fortune. Now, people who are doing drugs have got a bit more sympathy because addiction is being considered a disease. In neuroscience, it's shown that people have genes that lead to addiction if they're switched on. Um, versus sex though, sex is considered more of a choice so I can understand why the public would perceive helping the addicts more beneficial than helping people who are choosing to have sex even though I disagree with that, I think that all should be helped and disease should be kept to a minimum. Hepatitis C was a common contracted disease amongst the intravenous drug users in your book. Was it more common for prisoners to contra contract Hepatitis C while in prison, or was it more common for an inmate to have already contracted the disease prior to their stay in Maricopa? Nearly everyone I knew had contracted Hepatitis C in prison. You know, I did a census, went door to door, checked how many people were shooting up drugs, checked how many had Hepatitis C. In one building, 90% of the guys were shooting up drugs and two-thirds had Hepatitis C. Um, because they were so addicted, the jail wouldn't uh, give them the treatment, the 30000 to $50,000 a year it costs interferon, because they didn't want to spend that money on them because the prison system is a business model. The only ones who could get treated were the ones who would fight for the right to be treated in the court system or who had people outside with the money to get lawyers to get the treatment. And basically they say to the prisoners, you're still shooting up drugs. That disqualifies you from getting the treatment. Um, to get the treatment, you have to prove that you weren't shooting up drugs through your own testing and that, that's how the ones ended up getting the treatment in the end but they put up all kinds of barriers for you to get the treatment and as that disease progresses I had a friend in there who died a couple of years ago he was denied the treatment and his liver had been eaten up so much by the time he got released it was too late for him and he died a couple of years later. You mentioned in your book Hard Time that amongst prisoners there were three types of homosexuals those who were openly gay before and after their arrest, those who were temporarily openly gay in jail but that do not tell their wives and girlfriends, nicknamed gay for the stay, and those in the closet. The first two groups boast about their conquests and ultimately reveal the members of the latter. For those who were openly gay and who boasted about their sexual con conquests, 
Whether these posts are more of a reflection of inmates' hypersexuality or whether they are a reflection of power and dominance associated with the above-mentioned sex acts? I think a combination of all three, hypersexuality, male dominance, uh, boastfulness. I had a friend in there called Frankie. He was a Mexican Mafia hitman. He was doing 29 years and he was constantly hitting on everybody. Um, he would send me love letters. Um, <laughs> well, the first time he came to my cell, I was locked down, my, my pants and boxes were down and I was applying antifungal ointment to the bleeding bed sores on my behind. A couple of hours later, I got a mysterious love letter shoved under my door, commenting on my hurry arse and proposing we have a gay prison marriage. His exact words were, I'm looking forward to shampooing your hurry ass on our honeymoon in San Francisco. Now, fortunately, <laughs> I never went down that road with him, even though he tried multiple times throughout my in in entire incarceration. I mean, he was so hypersexual that even when we were locked down, in lockdown, people pass contraband from cell to cell using what's called fishing lines. They'll get like little strips of cotton from the bedding or the towels, and they'll tie items and they'll fish them out of the cell and someone else will fish his line out of the cell he'll have like a, a toothpaste or a toothbrush on it as a weight and then pull them back into his cell so Frankie he fished his line over to his neighbor's cell he tied the line to his own penis and he had his neighbor yanking the line so it was it was masturbating his penis so yeah the you know there's all kinds of levels of sexual activity going on in jail it absolutely blew my mind ranging from consensual sex right up to gangs renting out sex slaves to make money from prostitution you mention in your book that cheetahlins were in high demand but that sexual activity amongst interracial inmates regardless of sexual identity was often frowned upon was race more prevalent with regards to the taboos surrounding inmate sexual intercourse, or were these taboos more of a result of sexual orientation and identity? Everything in prison is racially determined by the gang members, but it would depend upon the particular mix of gang members you were housed with as to whether, what degree the races could actually mix, uh, from levels of friendship right up to, until sex because there was a point in the Maricopa County Jail where the Italian Mafia were actually running the white race and they had a lot of power and a lot of stuff was going on on a nightly basis there was like a fellatio show of this white guy and some other guys were getting receiving oral sex from a transsexual that was Native American and uh, people would you know be up in the night watching this commenting and clapping and, and it was like a comedy show basically for the prisoners but after the Italian Mafia got moved out and the Aryan Brotherhood neo-Nazi gang took back over, that was ended. And I'll just read what I wrote about that in my book, Hard Time. The new gang member coming in taking over was Big Wood, and he was with the Aryan Brotherhood. Big Wood, who commands respect due to his reputation in the prison system, takes over the white gang. He orders the whites he doesn't like to roll out of the pod, gets the rest to behave, and stops the nightly fellatio show in 2B, a neighbouring pod whereby after lockdown a Native American transsexual can be seen from our cells bobbing his head between the legs of a white inmate on the toilet at the front of the cell. Prior to Big Wood's arrival, bored prisoners had enjoyed commenting on these performances, generating lots of amusing sexual banter. Big Wood sends a note to the head of the whites in 2B saying the receiver of the oral sex is disgracing the white race and must be smashed if it continues. It stops immediately.